Rosemary Joyce, who is a professor in anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Rosemary's recent book, The Future of Nuclear Waste, I also have to hand. Uh, another very important intervention in these fields, another must read along with the others, uh, which engages in questions of materiality and non-human matter and some of these questions amongst many other things. Over to you, uh, Rosemary. Um, thank you. I hope that the uh, PowerPoint is visible. Um, yes. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share um, some of my thinking about temporality in particular, and what happens if we shift from an anthropocentric to a geocentric temporality in imagining the long term. Um, to do this, I'm going to reflect on the project on U U.S. planning to guard nuclear waste repositories that um, is embodied in the book. Um, in light of ongoing work that I'm doing about geontologies. So what you're looking at is uh, one vision of the future of a place today called Yucca Mountain, it's already come up today, located in the US state of Nevada. In this visualization, Yucca Mountain is a desert landscape transformed in its future through the cultivation of genetically modified plants that would appear violet and glowing. This is the archetype of one view of the US West as empty, devoid of life, ready to become what's been called a sacrifice zone. Although the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Environmental Protection Agency, and other US agencies share an understanding of this as an empty, lifeless place, appropriate as a sacrifice zone, they visualize the future of Yucca Mountain somewhat differently. In their visualization, it's a container for nuclear waste, selected for its projected long-term stability. In that regulatory future, the changelessness of Yucca Mountain is inherent in its geological nature, projected one million years into the future based on a concept of long-term geologic stability. Against the stable vision of Yucca Mountain as inherently inert, the only change envis envisaged in the future is caused by agencies with shorter-term cycles, human intrusion, to be warded off by a system of what are called passive institutional controls, alternatively called markers or monuments, which the planning for Yucca Mountain in, uh, continues to call for. That vision of Yucca Mountain is the one that underpins US nuclear planning. It's not the only way to imagine the temporality of the long-lived phenomenon that is Yucca Mountain, however. For local Native American people of Shoshone and Paiute tribes, this is not an inert mountain, but a living being. The difference in perception of the geological entity, something we might consider as a product of different ontologies, is, I would argue, a beginning point for us to rethink long-term temporalities from a less anthropocentric, more geocentric perspective. In some ways, such a move is already underway in US regulatory guidance, which shifted the time horizon for planners for against uh, human intrusion for these kinds of uh, um, repositories from 10,000 years to 1 million years. It was the 10,000 year horizon that formed the basis of the project that I explored in some detail in my 2020 book, The Future of Nuclear Waste. Um, in that book, I reviewed an iterative process through which US government agencies developed regulatory proposals for markers to ward off future intrusions in closed geologic waste repositories, of which the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, is already in operation. This involved a sequence of expert consultations that began actually before WIP with the Hanford, uh, with um, exploration of how to mark the Hanford site, um, that began, uh, that includes scenarios constructed by so-called futures experts, the futures panel, in response to which a team of markers experts, or two teams really, proposed designs for an effective marker system to ward off intrusions. There was a fascinating disjunction between the temporality of the regulations seeking protection over a 10,000 year period and the scenarios of intrusion that were created by the futures experts. Multiple scenarios predicted intrusion within a mere 100 years after the projected closure of the site which was taken as 1991 in the original exercise. While well, one of the futures teams assiduously explored options at the 10,000 year end of the temporal range, the majority of the scenarios considered time horizons between 150, 500 years into the future. 
this, I would argue, is partly reflective of the methodology for ensuring the effectiveness of markers that was shared by both the futures and the markers experts. This is embodied in the design that was proposed as a result of this multi-stage exercise and which is um, memorialized currently in publications by the Waste Isolation Pilot Project. Um, I analyze this as based on a common sense understanding of archeological sites that today are heritage monuments, using them as analogs for the future operation of a marker system. Um, in this way, the markers to be placed around the perimeters of protected sites are envisaged as updating Stonehenge, allowing for at least 4,000 years of endurance. And some experts argued even more since they claimed modern technology would allow improvements on the original analog. So this is a temporality on the order of millennia and a temporality of changelessness over millennia. A second feature of the design, an earthen berm, was projected to last for at least 1,000 years, based on a somewhat more flexible understanding of the dating of earthen platforms from the US Midwest, including Monk's Mound at Cahokia and the Great Serpent Mound. A third element of the design, a central above ground information center, returned the design to the longer span suggested by Stonehenge. This element was given an estimated life of 4,500 years as a functional interpretable marker based on Newgrange. Um, so the proposed marker system was framed as reproducing the endurance of certain archeological sites that were treated as having um, been intended to last into the future and potentially to represent their past makers to a future viewer who exists in our time. <clears throat> in my book, I examine the ways that the archaeological models for the marker system undermine the assumptions of stability over thousands of years, beginning with the actual interventions each of these experienced at intervals during their prolonged existence and extending to the actual fluidity of the materials from which they are made, which were treated as stable, inert, um, and inactive. Against the language of the experts, for example, uh, in which granite figured as the most stable of stones, specifically repeatedly claimed to resist the test of time, a phrase that's also come up today, I explored the material science showing that granite is under a constant, if very slow, process of decay. <clears throat> the design of the proposed marker system, <clears throat> I argued, owed more to imagination of things that last, framed against a sense of the limits of temporality based on human lives, so that 4,000 years becomes long-term when compared with the single or even multi-generational awareness of human lifetimes. This anthropocentrism was signified in the startling emphasis promotional material at WIP places on a second source of analogs for markers, which were creative works akin to contemporary land art installations. And here in the, um, the official poster for the site markers, the image that you see here is actually of a model that was rejected in the planning. It's not what's to be implemented, even though I, it um, has gained traction internationally, actually, as a vision of these kinds of plans. The image chosen for the website describing the marker system used architectural sketches based on a theory of place archetypes, understood to inherently induce similar reactions in humans regardless of the historical context. And so this raises the idea of temporalities that last, that endure, and um, the idea of temporalities uh, in invoking changelessness versus change. The landscape scale installations that formed part of this visualization were both reminiscent of and explicitly related by the experts to late 20th century art practice of land art, exemplified in the um, planning process by Roden Crater in Northern Arizona. Roden Crater enlists the landscape to place human participants in temporalities of geological and even astronomical scale. This is a repeated aspect of land art works, linked in artist statements to the idea that these artworks create the kind of record of lawn endurance that geological forces produce. And here we see 
uh, possibly the most famous land artist, Robert Smithson's um, repeated framing, I like landscapes that suggest prehistory. Many of these works evoke entropy, conceived of as a gradual process of decay or the chance fluctuation of form produced over time through non-human agencies of water, wind, erosion, and the breakdown or alteration of geological materials used in these projects. Spiral Jetty here, Smithson's possibly most iconic project, is regularly inundated by the waters of the Great Salt Lake, which also deposits uh, salt crystals on it that become visible when it is above water level. So Ashok Sukumaran's a winning artistic concept for a competition to create alternative marker systems for Yucca Mountain, with which I began, is in some ways related to these other projects. Although it marshals non-humans more widely recognized as living, but these have temporalities akin to the human. So we're still working with the temporality of a human or an anthropomorphic scale. In Sukumaran's uh, uh, project, Activity is reserved to the living matter, the plants and humans assembled on Yucca Ridge, which itself remains an inert surface that could be the image of geological stability that US regulatory agencies now project on it. In this, um, and, and here we can see, this is from Sukumaran's uh, artist statements, the idea is that upon seeing the stretch of mutated Yucca, viewers would instinctively comprehend the dangers of what lies beneath. So you can see the same kind of claim of, of uh, universality and reaction. In this, Sukumaran's project replicates a move taken in the otherwise radical book, How Forests Think, in which anthropologist Eduardo Cohn, pursuing an anthropology beyond the human, nonetheless excludes from his world of post-humanist signification, all that is geological in composition. Stone, he tells us, uh, doesn't have a semiotics. But Yucca Mountain is not inert, unchanging, or necessarily geologically stable within its own lawn lifespan. The activity of mountains may seem imperceptible at a human scale, but that does not mean they are not changing. That does not mean that they are not actors. When I regard the mountains surrounding the valley where I conduct archaeological work in Honduras, I can treat them as unchanged over the entire span of human presence there, a temporality that matches the original target of 10,000 years used in the US nuclear waste planning process. But these mountains, in fact, are steadily, continually at work, their liveliness perceptible in the products of weathering that scatter their surfaces, form at their margins, and are transported by water to form extensions of their presence in valleys below. That activity is visible to humans, if they attend to the presence of boulders, cobbles, and other expressions of aging that the mountain produces that mark its long life. It's with this acknowledgement that the prolonged temporality of mountains does not imply changelessness or a lack of dynamism that I return to the alternative ontological framing provided by Paiute and Shoshone people. For them, Yucca Mountain is alive. It's actually in motion, possibly briefly resting before proceeding on its Western trajectory. This is a conception of lawn temporality from a geocentric rather than an anthropocentric perspective, one in which what to us human seems a lawn period of stasis is a constant suggest succession of slow tempo changes from the molecular to the sedimentary. It's in these slow continuous tempos we might approach a consideration of how mountains think and what they might remember about us in the future beyond our temporal horizons a future they share with other geo beings, including those we characterize as radioactive waste, as a way to turn our temporalities into primary metrics. Thank you.